um, that I was pausing for about 40 seconds. And I have to tell them the truth is because I do not know how to use the internet apparently. But uh, even now as I speak, there's a little blue circle still making its rounds. And I have no idea if that means we're good to go or I'm speaking to myself. But either way, I think I'm just going to keep speaking. I don't know. Hopefully that's better than having a long pause. I doubt it. <laughs> Amen. Well, guys, I'm going to jump in and uh, have a word of prayer here. Father, I thank you for this time that uh, I get to spend with God, your people, Father, those that you love and cherish. Father, I pray that you would uh, forgive me of my sins, have mercy on me, Father, a sinner, and please remove me and allow your spirit to speak clearly, uh, boldly when it should, <clears throat> and gently when it ought as well. Father, I thank you so much for all that you have given to us, the way that you watch over and bless us, all that you are, Father. You are exactly who you say you are, Father, to you be all credit and glory and praise for this, God. I pray that you would help uh, open our minds today so that we can understand the scriptures. I feel like it's such a difficult concept to try and explain, but well worth the effort over and over and over again so that, Father, we can embrace um, our sonship with you and, Father, reject slavery, Father. And uh, also, I just, of course, God, continue to pray for those who are suffering right now with this uh, life-stealing virus, God, I pray that, uh, God, please, in our communities, Father, here in Albuquerque as well, Father, just that uh, we would be wise, God, the leadership, God, they would be wise. I pray that, you, pray that you would put something on the leadership's heart, Father, not just for my city, but, Father, for uh, the cities around this nation, Father, that they would uh, be given wisdom from above, Father, and not just uh, simple instincts that uh, we gather here, Father. I just pray Again, Father, that you would watch over them, and uh, I pray that they understand that their influence, their words, Father, they have so much power uh, because of the position that they are in. And I pray, Father, you would give them the wisdom to use that influence to help and to serve and not to cater. And uh, Father, I just thank you so much for all that we have in you, all that you've given to us. I pray, God, that you would bless us, watch over our families, Father, and uh, help us, God, to be a servant. Uh, to you and to those in need during this time, Father, that we would, Father, lend ourselves to those who uh, are in trouble, Father, who need extra help, whatever that might be, Father, we wouldn't send people away and say, be warm and well-fed, but <laughs> not right now, but instead we'd inconvenience ourselves and, Father, show the love of Christ to this world, Father, in everything that we do, I pray for your wisdom, Father, and I pray that we do it in humble service to you, Father not looking for credit, but our left hand acting without the knowledge of our right, Father, so that we may never boast, but uh, in the end, simply declare to God be all glory and praise, Father. Lord, we love you and praise in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, well, I want to start off with a small review from yesterday, because I know that was a lot, but the uh, I want to go over the general concepts. We talked about um, being a son of God, and what an incredible privilege it is to be uh, a family member um, to be drafted in and grafted in, and uh, how the enemy has always been so jealous of that position, so incredibly envious of it, that it's it do anything to stop it. And that includes stealing your sonship, stealing your place in the family by way of perversions. And uh, these, these are not, I think we got to get the idea that, um, our enemy has big fangs and blood and is very scary and violent. Uh, violence, of course, absolutely. Uh, but the way that I've seen Satan operate in the scriptures is counterintuitive to anything that we've put out there. I'm not sure where we got our images from or anything like that. But from what I read and what I've seen is that Satan can look very, very crafty. He can he can be in the churches. He can be right there with us. Um, he understands the scriptures well. He can use them proficiently. Um, there's a lot of things to be scared of. And you say, well, how do I know? How am I going to know the difference? Well, the Bible's always been very clear is that we still have got to test fruits. We still have got to look to the fruit of someone's life. There's fruits of the spirit and there's fruits of the flesh. And by their fruit, we'll recognize. Now, this doesn't mean that there won't be good deeds and things like this. This is one of the most evil fruit in the world 
is uh, Irene talked about it a little bit yesterday is sprinkling the yeast, a little bit of leaven. Because you don't have to change, you didn't have to come in and change the churches or anything, but just enough to divide them, just enough to kind of, you know, uh, or, or build self righteousness into the churches where everyone's performance uh, oriented. And this is a hellish way to try and walk with God. Um, it's a yoke that is not with Jesus, but rather with the law. And, and at the same time, you're trying to balance, well, how do I adhere to Christ and his law and show my obedience, my adherence to understanding his command and not be legalistic? You see, it's a very, uh, you have to have a, a deep understanding of, of who Christ is. Without Christ, this is the central figure. This is the reason why we are Christians. Um, we follow him. We're baptized into him, into his church, his body. Uh, we are the bride of him, not the other way around. He's the head. And so everything revolves around Jesus, the person who uh, is the redeemer and the bridge between heaven and earth. But we saw that one of the more deceptive ways demons work is that they come in through the back door, through the churches. They can come in. They, they don't necessarily, they're not mad if there's religious practices going on, just as long as they're false, just as long as they don't teach anything. That might change someone's heart and set them free. Just as long as you can keep people trapped in that system. That's very deceptive. That's very deceiving. That's that It, it almost feels unfair. And at the same time, at the end of this one, we're going to give uh, all of us as, as Christian soldiers just the biblical tools that God gives us in order to navigate through this, in order to enjoy your freedom. In order to, yes, be on that absolute edge because you are under attack. There's no doubt in my mind about that. I hope there's none left for you. But at the same time, just recognize that we're not trying to go backwards towards slavery. That's not the attempt here. When you see people fired up and more passionate than normal, it's not because we're trying, we're so anxious to get you back into bondage. No, it's because I'm, I know for me, I can only speak for myself. I'm so excited to see faith spring up again. I'm so excited to see it right in front of me where people are expressing their love openly. They are, and it's it's just passionate. It's powerful. Um, there's something to it where it's just, hey, I want everyone to know that I want God to have all the glory. I, I just That's something I want. All of us have even expressed this. I was listening to Irene uh, today, and it was a, a phenomenal message. Uh, but she kept, she would mention it over and over, and I think I was mentioning a little bit too yesterday, is that Many of us that are doing this right now, it's not as if we enjoy this. Uh, I want you to understand that. It's not as if I, I look at this as a task. There's no, I, in no way. In fact, I wouldn't do it if it was a task. I know myself better than that. I, I'd reject that. But even though this is uncomfortable, even though I don't enjoy doing this, and it, it does feel awkward, okay? It's just, as weird as it seems, it, it probably, that's, that's how I feel, okay? But if the Word of God, when it gets stirred into a... If, if, the, if we hold it in, if we don't let it out, first of all, there's, there's a couple things that happen. One is you deny anything that God was willing to use you for, because who knows who I'm reaching, okay? But secondly, and I think this is important, you've got to remember the prophet Jeremiah. When, when God puts something on your heart and you say, uh, if, I, if I say I will not mention or speak any more in his name or in his word, his word is in my heart like a fire, fire shut up in my bones, I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. So right now, that's that's kind of where I find myself, okay? Just to be honest, uh, this is where I find myself is I don't think I could hold that in because I think it's so important. And I haven't seen it like that. And I've always been more of a, I love to support. I'll, I'm, I'm very good at uh, the rah-rah, you know, at times. Uh, but I like to support. I do those. I'm ready to pick a fight at any time with the enemy. I'm ready to go to battle with those that are ready to come to battle with me. I, I like that's more my speed. This is not. But this is so important. If we can understand some of these things, oh man, it's just, all I know is that what it's done for my heart and what it's done for my mind. And it's so refreshing. It's so freeing. I would feel extremely selfish if I didn't at least make this attempt in the name of Jesus. Okay. Uh, so we saw some of the different apostles, John, they were just talking about demon attack. They were talking about the spiritual warfare that all of us are in. And that we can no longer deny it. But he's also, we saw Paul's great concern after he built these churches and planted them. He says, I don't want to see you go back. Because we got to remember what was happening in, in uh, Paul's time. And also, the number one warning you find in the New Testament 
is warnings about false teachings, false teachers, false prophets. That's the number one warning. One of those false teachers isn't even the false religions of like Artemis and you know all these different uh, pagan gods like Pan over in Philippi and things. One of them was the Judaizers who would see the towns that have been revitalized, that have faith, that have a, a small understanding of Judaism, uh, Judaism, but of course a much larger understanding in the power of freedom and grace and who Christ is and how he worked throughout uh, Judaism. But you, you see, th they, these guys would come in and say, you guys got part of the story, but here's the rest. And they would come in and guys, th these, were your, these were your religious leaders of the day. They had it down. They prayed for hours in front of the town. I mean, they had it down. The phylacrities, they had every, they, this is what you guys are missing. You're missing circumcision. You're missing adherence to the law. You're missing this. Now, this is a difficult concept for pastors to preach. Okay. I believe that because you want to see someone's heart be set free to the point where these are not commands anymore. The, the new command of love is not a command of the law. Okay, because in the law, you had to do these things. And this was and Satan came in and would use that against people. We'll see that as we study today. He says, hey, man, prove yourself, prove yourself. by, And eventually God would get tired of this. It's like, guys, you missed the point. Now you're just slaughtering cows to make yourself feel good. It's almost like people were coming home and bragging about it. <laughs> like, man, I had to slaughter three bulls today, if you know what I'm saying. It was a rough week. That's terrible. Uh, they were missing the point completely. But we're going to talk about that. And we're going to end on a very high note because I want to show, even though the demons attack, and it's a confusing thing. It's like, how do I gracefully move forward in obedience and at the same time not get tied up in legalism? Basically, how do I be become a son and claim hold of my identity in Christ, that I am a child of God without ever going back to slavery? But at the same time, I want to keep moving. I don't, I don't want to go backwards. I want to keep my... my Obedience. Why? Well, one thing we understand in the in the New Testament is obedience is very much alive and well. It's not as if grace replaces the the understanding of obedience, but the motivation begins to change. The motivate because you have got to understand that you were bought at a high price, and that price was no longer a cow. It's no longer your favorite bull. It's no longer no. You understand it was the redeemer of the world. This changes everything. This changes absolutely everything, and this is why Jesus is everything to this world to you to i and to the rest of this world and they'll know it one day if not not in this lifetime so we went to this he doesn't want them to go back to um these different uh gods and everything. and he we went through the different um ways that the the our key text would describe it as you want you can't go back to these weak and beggarly elemental spirits or weak and be beggarly elements or weak and miserable principles or weak and worthless elemental things. So <laughs> every single one of those included the word weak. So there is something to be said about having weak faith and how that it won't help you. It won't help you to just show up. You know, sometimes <laughs> people think that, and like I said, I can only use examples from my own life, but I've seen that too. When you come into the gym, there's a lot of guys that are there to hang out at the cooler and talk politics but they're just not making any progress. They're not getting any healthier. They're not moving in any direction because they've missed the purpose of the gym. We can also miss the purpose of praise and worship. We can miss the purpose of going to church and being with the fellowship and being united like that. We can miss that point and just be there for the, the goosebump feelings, I guess. So I want to show this. I want to read this uh, here again. This is back in our key text, verse uh, 10 and 11. It says, you're observing special days, months, and seasons of the year. Uh, I fear for you that somehow I may have wasted my efforts on you. You see, again, this is a city where the Judaizers came in. They would follow Paul, okay? Uh, they would follow these guys on their missionary journeys because they were seeing things. The truth is, I, I, I don't know for certain, but I, I believe Many of them became obedient to the faith. Many of them saw the impact of Christ and saw them Christ doing something that just Judaism couldn't do. It wasn't designed to be what Christianity is. And we'll get to that in a, in a little bit, okay? But we're going to just try and use the, the passages here as best we can. But 
here's what he was afraid of is that these guys would come in and they would impress these young Christians. Do you know how they impressed them? It's because they were legal. They were pure. These guys were religious. These guys had morality covered in spades. You think you're moral? Talk to this guy. You think that you understand? Talk to this guy. Today, we often, our pastors, they show their influence on their church by the size of their house or the car that they drive or the rings that they wear or, uh, you know, think about how much, how little has changed and how if the New Testament's number one priority was to warn against false teachers, what do you think ours is going to be? How much is how much is really really changed, and this is why Satan has such a foothold on the church at times. It's because we don't recognize him. It's hard to fight him when you don't see him, and the best way to hide is right in front of us. That's all the how all the great magicians, all the great tricksters. That's how they do it. But look at Paul's plead. In another, this is another book in the in the scriptures. This is in Galatians, no longer in Ephesians, but in Galatians, he's trying to warn them. I don't want you to go back to that, and he's speaking from experience. Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, a Pharisee among he was trained by Gamaliel, top guy. He had education from Rome. He was a Roman citizen. He knew Judaism left, right, sideways, back, and front, and he's telling, I don't want you to go back to that. I know that they put on a show. I know that that looks impressive, but that is all an illusion because he reminds them of this. Look at this. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirits by the work, the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you for, by, by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believing God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So that's Paul being still a masterful teacher. At the very end, he, he offers an Old Testament reference to show that righteousness apart from works righteousness apart from the law and how that was a precursor of things to come but here he's telling like who who came in and tricked you later on he'll ask questions like who cut in on the race you were running such a you were doing so well why would a christian who started off so well revert and lose their freedom and all of a sudden all of their all of their works they're not stemming from faith any longer. They're stemming from adherence. You're trying to be like everyone else. When we start saying stuff like, well, Pastor Steve said this and Pastor Steve said that, I think that's awesome. We all need to get advice from our pastors. But not one. To remember why the Reformation happened is so that men wouldn't rely on men so much. You can only confess your sin to the guy in the box. You could only, you had all these rules, all these regular, and Martin Luther said, no, 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 no. That's not what the Bible says. I know Pope Johnson or whatever his name is, Gregory and all that. I'm sure they're awesome. But God is far greater. And you and I, well, the Bible says we're competent to train each other. We're competent to do that with each other. Confess your sins to one another, not to a guy in the box just because he holds a title. The same has to be true for us now as we can't revert back because here's why we accept these roles. They feel great. I always warn my pastors about this. If idolatry was such a big deal in the past because people would make things out of wood and worship them, what do you think the modern day pulpit can be? Everyone wants to preach. Everyone wants their turn. Guys, that, that's a piece of wood. Don't crave that. Desire to serve. That's the difference between learning, you know, being uh, uh, manipulated by something that seems holy, has a good appearance to it, and being driven by the truth, where you don't even care if you get to, I, I listen to this, and I, 
I don't want to use these examples because they, they can be taken out of context, but this is true. I have never applied for any of the positions I've been given within the church. Not once. Not once. Not even when I was asked to come into the ministry. I'm not saying that that's because it's all from heaven. I'm just saying this is that I would never have even thought to ask. Okay. Now I have lost some of that along the road. Okay. That's just being honest and being real. I have lost some of that. But I'm telling you, this time of refinement is bringing that back. I'm like, no, you get in front of that. I know it feels weird. I know the kids have this. I know this is going on. You get out there and you serve. You give your heart, Alex. God giving you something. Give it back. What if I hid that talent? I can't do that any longer. And I hope that you feel the same way. That would be the point of all of this. Okay. What Paul's trying to teach here as well. Not just for me. <laughs> Amen. But you see in both... Uh, Galatians 3 that we just read in our, our key text is the danger is that Christians will turn back from dependence on the Spirit of God where they're free and they want they can do whatever they want, but they only want to do the will of God. That's that's beautiful freedom. That's freedom that's bought at a price. Or they're going to go back and they're going to depend on themselves, the flesh. So, well, how come you're a good servant? Like, well, did I not drive out demons in your name? Did I not do this? Did I not do that? Did I not? Away from me, you evil doer. I never knew you. Why is that? Because when I was hungry, you didn't bring me anything. See, it's service. It's not the glow that you can put on yourself. It's the way that we can make Christ shine. And when doing so, you help everyone else but, you know, with you as well. Because the truth is, you and I, we don't have what it takes to save anybody. Okay. What we can do is bring them to the one who can. What an honor. What a beautiful, I mean, what a job. What a description of a life. I save the souls eternally. That's that's what I do. That's the well, why do you do that? Sounds hard. You don't know, you don't know my boss. <laughs> he made me family. But we're gonna get into that in a second. Okay, I, I don't want because here's the deal. The reason why it's so hard is like, well, I go to church all the time. Why is now different? Why am now things are changing? It's, many times we're starting to break free because church has changed during this time. If you were a pastor who used to come down from the rafters off of a wire with smog machines and, and smoke coming through and your band was, I mean, literally like you had five of them. They were on rotation. You had a stage that spun. You don't have any of that anymore. And the truth of the matter is, and I've seen the numbers you also don't have people coming to your online services because God was a concert for your church. And that's the problem. It was your church. You let it be God's church again, and you can cut out all that stuff, and you'll still have the... That's the thing is we still have to trust that. I'm not saying be boring. That's crazy. I would never suggest that. But don't mark it the church preach the gospel let that come from your heart it's beautiful the guy that reached out to me man he, <laughs> it wasn't even a smooth approach <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> in all honesty i should have left but check this out this is how deceptive it can be you remember romans chapter 7 and many of us love this chapter because we get to see the humanity of paul the things i want to do i don't seem to do them and then i want and then i hate myself for not doing it. Like, ah. <laughs> and it's confusing <laughs> But he makes some brilliant observations. One of them, so theologically rich, verse 11, he says, For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. This is demonic operation at the highest level. Sin, the opposite of what God offers, seizes the opportunity afforded by the commandment. That is so deceptive. That is so hard to deal with. So sin will make you feel the guilt, the weight of your not adherence to the, to the commandments. That's one attack, but that's not the only one. There's so many more. But see, what Paul's saying here, and he's making a point, is that the demons and Satan, they love to take God's holy laws. They take, take God's word. And the, the law was meant as a gift to mankind, but they'll use it to deceive us, to kill us with it. 
And they tempt us to use the law as a proving ground, a vehicle for our own righteousness. We know that this is, we've seen the, the, the ultimate warning from Jesus in the Beatitudes, Matthew 7. Hey, God, I did this, I did this, I did this. And he said, I don't, I don't even know who you are. Away from me, you evildoer. So how could I have done evil if I had never, if I did all these good things? You see what I'm saying? Sin sees the opportunity. So see, Satan doesn't care if we have great intentions and we do a lot of stuff. Okay, we can go out and fight for a, a equal, you know, a pro-life bill. Satan will support that. Why not? You do all these things just as long as you take credit for it. Just as long, like, you know why Irene's having such an impact here lately and, and Liddell as well? Is There's something that you'll hear throughout their preaching. They always say, to God be the glory. It's, it's just, it happens all the time. And it's not a, a hiccup. It's not something we pick up in preaching school. I know I went to the same school they did. I didn't hear that. I didn't pick up that lesson. But that's important. What we're trying to give, what you're preaching, all of them are trying to do right now is solidify the training that's going on. I'm not trying to drag anyone back into legalism. I wouldn't want that. See, I had some great conversations after my last lesson. And I, this, I, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to put you in a, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. No, no, what I'm saying is G, when you follow Jesus and you're yoked with him, it's actually much lighter. The same things that you're resisting, the same thing you're saying, I cannot possibly do, is a much heavier yoke. In fact, the Bible calls it an anchor. You know, but here, the Bible says if you're yoked with Jesus, with Jesus his, it's light. It's, he's humble in heart, able to teach. You can actually come to him when you're weary. So when you're weary, the last thing a person would do is think to put a yoke around their neck. But in Christ, we can trust that our Savior can handle the yoke even when we cannot. You think that you're going to be afforded that by the world? No, you just will not. But see, Paul had always had to try and prove himself. He was like, hey, I'm not the super apostle you guys were waiting for. He was always fighting these Judaizers. He was always fighting these guys who wanted these new Christian churches to just crank it up a notch. You know, hey, let, you're doing great, but here's the, here's what the law says. you got to do this. And then when you do that, sweet. But then don't forget to do this. And then, hey, have you guys been circumcised yet? You know, I mean, they just kept adding and adding and adding. And Paul even tells him, he gets sick of it eventually. He's like, you'll travel the whole world just to go convert someone and make them twice the son of hell as you are. Because this is what Paul saw. He's like, when you drag people back into this, you yourself are not benefiting from this. Why would you bring someone else to this? Listen to what this says in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 13. It says, for such people, this is Paul defending himself are false prophets, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Again, you can see the, the point here is fruit. What does the fruit of their life say? This matters to our Father. Your heart matters to our Father more than all your amazing actions. Because the truth is, when you accomplish great things, I believe that's the greatest testing ground you'll ever receive in your life. When you do something for Christ and it blows your mind, because you, you didn't even think you had it in you. <laughs> the moment you take credit for that, the demons rejoice. God hasn't given up because he knows who you are. But I'm saying the demons will rejoice because false religion is so much more demonic than atheism. Because in atheism, you have a choice, you have a chance. But with false religion, you end up in the lukewarm category. So you could be hot for God, you could be a son, you could have absolutely no feelings at all, you could be cold. God says it's better to be one or the other. Because when you find yourself in the middle, and you don't know what, and you're confused, ah, ah, I'm getting pulled all over, you, you're in a very bad position. The Bible says, Revelation chapter 3, that God's about to spit you out because he can't handle it. It's uh, it's disgusting. And now we see him talking now. This was uh, talking to Galatians, or uh, excuse me, Corinth. 
And now here he is talking to uh, Rome here in, uh, in Romans chapter 10. He says, verse 3, Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. This is such a powerful teaching, and it is so hard to preach this and teach this. It's almost like you get back into this, like, I wonder if, if uh, Paul and James, if they're talking about different things, are they on the same page? Of course, they're on the same page, but they are discussing difficult matters. Okay, James does a great job of saying, well, if you build up that faith, you're going to have action with it. It will be a natural overflow. The Bible is very clear. Overflow of the, the heart, the mouth will speak. Well, what if you wanted your mouth to say awesome, holy things? Well, you better fill your heart to that. So much so that it's over. So much so that you don't even have to put out the effort. Do you know what overflow means? You're not pouring. You're not doing anything. Do you see what I'm saying? You're living your life in Christ. Out of gratitude, out of humility. Some of these laws, they become, you start to understand certain passages. Like, hey, all the laws hang on these two. If you can love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor like yourself. The, the laws hang up. You have, if you get these two down without even trying, you're going to fulfill the law. You're going to fulfill all these other things. Love covers a multitude of sin. If you're a loving individual, you're not going to murder. Okay. <laughs> I hate to bring it up the obvious ones, but these are things. And you say, but I'm still a sinner. I'll always be. A, you're right about that. But you are a redeemed sinner, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven with a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Live a life worthy of that calling. It's called gratitude. When you start to move with passion and you start to read your Bible looking for, I want to get a nugget. I want to take something away from this. That's worshiping the Father in truth and in spirit. Because the truth is, you're not going to get any credit for that. You're doing that simply to honor God. That's what I want my children to do for me. You see what I'm saying? I know I can force them to do what I want them to do. <laughs> and they'll be obedient. Okay? But it brings incredible joy to my heart. When I see them taking those lessons, using them naturally without even, and watching them benefit. Watch it right in front of me. Right in front of me. I can see it. So that's godly training right that's the benefits of it. He's not going to see the same pain in this world that others will see, prayerfully. And if he does, I believe he'll be ready. But you have got to be able to be in that position. You say, I'm going to choose to be a son, meaning I want to give, I want to serve for the right reasons. You remember the parable uh, Jesus gives. He says, hey, man, there's a farmer. He's got two sons. One of them says, I need you to go to the, 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 the field today. I need you to do this. And he says, yes, Father. <laughs> yes, you got it. I got you covered, brother. I got you covered, Dad. The other son, he comes up and the other son's like, ah. Oh. But then he, later on, he thinks about it and he goes out and he does it. The one son that had all the great words, he never went. The son that had the bad attitude but ended up going. That's the one that is heralded in the scriptures as being the one who pleased his father that day. Okay? He got it. Self-denial. Put the cross on. The whole family benefited from that, from him doing it. That's how it used to work back then. If you did the, you got the farming done, the family got to eat. So this, this young man was able to figure that out, even though he was still very human. You see, sometimes we look for the right, like, oh, if he says the right thing, he does the right thing, he must, I mean, this is, must be it. No, Luke's can be deceiving. That's why David was the first king, true king of Israel. Not any of his tall, awesome, handsome, non-shepherding brothers. Okay? Because God will look at your heart. So I want to end this here with just this warning, because what we've seen is that the, the enemy, the devil, when he sneaks in, it's not the attack that maybe we're thinking of where the, there's violence, anger, blood all over him. And he's, I don't know, some, some people, I don't know, Dracula ish. No, no, no. Sometimes it's a very well-dressed individual who is just there as an agent of yeast, spread the yeast of the Pharisees, legalism. 
to spread the yeast of false religion, to spread the, the yeast of false doctrine. And it's like, well, how can false doctrine even exist today since we all own a Bible? <laughs> it only takes a little bit of yeast to work through the whole batch. As long as you say it, I call it like with having a hint of wisdom. Say something that merits some truth in reality, and then you can build whatever you want to off of that. Hey, guys. Hey, good morning. I just want to mention Jesus is Lord, right? Amen. Now, this weekend, we're all going to be washing uh, my car and my house. I figured it would be a great way to serve. I figured that would be this is what we, you know, this way you take care of the pastor because I work so hard for you guys. And So he took one thing. He said, Jesus is Lord, and I agree with that. But then he's asking everybody to come serve him. But he's the shepherd. He's the servant. I'm not saying don't encourage your pastors. That's what I do all the time. I love that. But we have to understand the pastor should never be in a position where he's asking for that. He, he, that. That shouldn't even be on his mind or heart because he loves the service so much. That he's willing or she's willing to do what it takes even when it doesn't feel comfortable. Irene mentioned something this morning that I want to touch on. Because I, I commented on it too because it, it just hit me. But he was talking about how we can see sin right in front of us. And not mention anything, not not really even care because I ah, would get along, get along, all that stuff. But see, this is the importance of leadership because most of pastoring has nothing to do with preaching awesome lessons and making people fall in love with your speaking ability. A lot of it has to do with talking to people about uncomfortable things. If you see sin there and you have to bring that up, Irene was. You know, mention it, you hand them over to Satan, not out of anger and spite. It's actually to save them. Because it doesn't make sense. Okay, like it, I, I, the only way I can describe this is imagine for a moment you got on everything, all, broad, you know, um, red skin gear, red skin helmet, red skin face mask, got the old hog thing from the 80s, red skin jersey, my favorite player of all time, Doug Williams, got his jersey on, got the I got even got the thigh pads on for some odd reason, red skin uh, shoes, and I go to watch a football game. What game do you think I'm going to watch? You Normally, you would say the Redskins, right? Now, imagine I'm over here and I'm cheering for the Cowboys and they're playing the Eagles. I'm not even watching the Redskins. It's just out of place because obviously my alignment on the outside looks like it's to the Redskins. But here I am watching their enemy, fascinated with how they play. Okay, that's a small, terrible example, but it's the only one I can think of from my life. Because see, <laughs> I played a lot of sports. That's my experience. But you know, that's that's you can't put on the clothing of Christ on the outward and not be transformed on the inside. So you can have outward obedience, and Satan will support you. Join another church. Do all um, just as long as t obey the Ten Commandments perfectly, but just take credit for it. Just look at yourself as one who made it. One who is righteous in their own eyes. And you will have been in the same category as foolish Galatians. Let's end with a strong note here. Galatians chapter 4 verse 3 through 7. We'll go back to our key text here. Strong word of hope to end things out. Thank God. <laughs> When we were children, we were slaves to the elemental spirits of the universe. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So through God, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir. This is so frustrating to our enemy. Your freedom in Christ, your desire to be the one that he's seeking, one that will worship in spirit and truth, not looking for credit, not looking for willing to receive your reward from the Almighty. This is a completely, it goes so against the grain. It, it flips the script completely. The world that Satan has designed, it literally get, turns on off of its axis. Axis, I should say, not axis, axis. It goes off axis. It, it changes the plan. 
Because you're saying, I'm not going to play this game with you. And when you stop playing games, you stop playing church, and you give up false religious practices, and you start getting real, you start confessing your sin in prayer, you start praising with real power, with just understanding, you start reading your Bible, looking for, why is the cross so important? How come it's not hitting me? And you start reading again. You start listening to messages again. You start to care again. You start to love again. Something's happening in you that both Jesus, Paul, John, James, and Peter, all those examples we read through, they don't want you to lose it. And neither do I. And I don't want that for myself either. Because we're in this together. Amen? So that's kind of how I saw that. Um, Very difficult to explain how you can have both of them. The law present in the sense of obedience, and yet the will and desire to do God's bidding outside of the authority of the law, but through gratitude for the price paid. This is a difficult thing to explain or talk through. But ultimately, it's so important because God has called you to be part of his family, into his sonship. And yet the enemy is trying to remove you, but instead of showing himself to be the opposite of God, he's decided to imitate portions of God so that he can deceive the elect. This is beyond frustrating, but this is why we're always on the lookout for false teachers, always on the lookout for false prophets, always. The fruit of your life, not the the works of your hands, but the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And I want you to read those fruits of the Spirit. You'll see it would be real hard to work for those. But the fruit of the Spirit, let that be what represents your tree. Now let that be what represents your life. Amen? Because going forward, it's the virus may leave, but the enemy is going to stay. And we're going to have to be called to continue to fight. And we need to do it together. There's a lot of power in that. Amen. All right, guys. So God, uh, God be the glory. I hope you enjoy your weekend. And uh, please stay safe. I know we're camping in the backyard this uh, time for Cub Scouts. So, Amen.